Well, here we are, the final lesson in our study of the book of Esther. This is lesson number eight, and the title of this lesson, I'm going to try to pronounce it correctly, is a victorious yet enigmatic ending. I should have just went with the word mysterious, but whatever. Okay, a victorious yet mysterious ending. All right, so we come to the book of Esther today. This is our final lesson. But before we get there, let me ask you a question. And no, this is not a trick question, okay? So I'm not trying to trick you. It's a real question. What is the difference between history and fiction? Pretty simple question, right? Simply stated, one is true, one is false, okay? History is a true account of events. Fiction is make-believe. It's pretend, right? Now, imagine you have two books. Do you think it matters when you start to read that book does it matter if you know if it's fiction or if it's history? How does that affect your expectations? Now, the difference is, for instance, if I pick up a book and you tell me it's history, then I don't expect to find the account of a superhuman who's faster than a speeding bullet, who flies around the world with a cape and shoots laser beams out of his eyes, right? Because that's not reality. So if you tell me it's history, I don't expect to find that. On the other hand, if I start reading a fiction book, anything goes, right? I'm at the mercy of the author. Whatever the author says is reality, is reality. So there's a big difference, right, in fiction and history. Let me give you another difference. With fictional writing, I expect the author to tell me everything I need to know. Okay? So... I not only want to know the events as they occur, but I want to know why. Right? Because the author is just making it up. It's fiction. And so I want the author to tell me everything. I want the author to tell me why things happen. I want the author to tell me the thoughts and the emotions and the motivations behind the characters. I want to know all of that if it's fiction. Now, if it's history, the author may not have access to all that information. If it's history, there will be times where a historical author can tell you about the events, but they may not be able to give you a lot of background. They may not be able to give you motivation or intent or feelings. Okay? We run into this as we complete the book of Esther. So we come to the end of Esther. We look at chapters 9 and 10 today. And everything kind of happens exactly, exactly as we would expect it to happen, with one exception. There is one exception. There is one surprise that we don't really know what to do with in Esther chapter 9. And here's the thing. That's what we would expect. This is a historical account. The author obviously was not privy to all of the emotions and the motivations of the main characters. So there's going to be some mystery here. There's going to be an enigma here that we're going to talk about. And that's okay because that's what we expect when dealing with history. We don't know all the facts. All right? We'll get to that in just a moment. Right now, let's talk about Esther chapter 9 and Esther chapter 10. We'll explain the events as they occurred, and then we'll talk about how they apply to us. But first, if you have not read Esther chapter 9 and 10, they're not very long chapters. It won't take you very long. Please take a moment and read Esther chapter 9, Esther chapter 10, and then we'll talk about it. All right. So, in Esther chapter 9, starting in verses 1 through 10, the 13th of Adar finally arrives. This is the day that Haman set aside to allow the enemies of the Jews to attack the Jews. And this is the day that now Mordecai has said the Jews can gather together and defend themselves. The day finally comes. What happens? Well, the Jews are victorious. That's what happens, okay? Haman intended the Jews to be destroyed. They're not destroyed. It's the enemies of the Jews that are destroyed. In fact, not only are the enemies that destroyed, but Haman's already dead, so he can't be killed again, but his ten sons are killed on this day. So all the enemies of the Jews are killed, including the ten sons of Haman. Scripture says in verse 5 of chapter 9, the Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. The Jews are victorious. Now, 
there are several things here that we do not want to miss. If we want to understand Esther, we have to understand a few things. First, the Jews were on defense. Okay, that's important to understanding the story. Esther chapter 9, verses 2 and 3 make it clear that the Jews did not go on the offensive. They did not go and attack. Okay, Scripture says, for instance, that the Jews gained mastery over those that hated them. Okay? Secondly, in verse 3, it says that they laid hands on those who sought their harm. Go back and look at that verse. Who did the Jews defeat? Those who sought their harm. The Jews did not go on the offensive. The Jews were on defense. They gathered together and they defended themselves against any attack. Okay? Second thing this tells us is that even though there were many who feared the Jews, go back to chapter 8, chapter 8 ends with, there's a lot of people who are now afraid of the Jews, there are a lot of people who are claiming to be Jews, okay? Even though many feared the Jews, there were obviously still some who were willing to take the risk, okay? There were obviously still a lot of people that were willing to take the risk and attack the Jews, and this shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us for a couple of reasons. First of all, the Jews have always had enemies. The Jews have always had enemies who would stop at nothing to destroy them. And here they're given a free pass. Here they're allowed to attack. Okay. And don't forget, there's also financial motivation. Not only are they allowed to attack the Jews, but they are allowed to plunder their enemies. So they're allowed to attack the Jews, and if they defeat them, they can take their land, their property, their money, their belongings. So here you have a group of people in the Jews who have been hated for many years. Their enemies are now told they can attack them and take their stuff. Yes, the Jews can defend themselves, but you're illegally allowed to attack them and take their stuff. There is always going to be somebody who will take you up on that offer. Look at the world today. We have laws. Okay, there's always the risk of punishment, but you have people who are always willing to take the risk. So it's clear here that there were some who were willing to take the risk. Again, this shouldn't surprise us. Not only was there financial gain, not only did the Jews have a lot of enemies, but keep in mind, the execution of Haman would have enraged and motivated some to attack the Jews, regardless of the consequences, in order to seek revenge. Haman's family would have wanted revenge. They were powerful. They were wealthy. They had a lot of friends. They would have said, we'll take the risk. Yes, the Jews can defend themselves, but we'll take the risk. The fact that all ten of Haman's sons were killed tells us that they did try to avenge their father. They just weren't successful because you can't beat God. All right. Keep in mind, not only was his family mad, or would have been mad, but Haman was a high-ranking official. He would have had powerful friends. He would have had powerful allies. Now, who is in Haman's place? Don't forget, Mordecai. Mordecai has now taken Haman's place. So all the friends of Haman, all the allies of Haman, would not have liked the fact that Mordecai's enemy, excuse me, that Haman's enemy, Mordecai, was now in charge. This would not have been well, gone well for them. This would not have benefited them. So they thought, hey, we need to take the risk. We need to take the risk specifically to kill Mordecai. Okay, because he's in a really powerful position. So, there were plenty that wanted revenge. There were plenty that, that would have taken that risk. Right. Furthermore, speaking of the fact that the battle even took place inside the capital city, we're going to talk more about that, but the battle took place in the capital city of Susa, uh, New Testament scholar, or excuse me, Old Testament scholar, J.G. McConville writes this. This suggests that the Jews had enemies besides Haman in high places. So it tells us that because the battle took place in the capital city, there were many inside the capital city. There were many in powerful places who were willing to attack the Jews. And of course they did. So that's important. One final thing that this tells us. Remember, what, what does this tell us? It tells us that, number one, the Jews are on defense. Number two, there were people who were willing to take the risk. And the third thing we need to take note of is in verse 10, 
And verse 10 tells us that while the Jews were victorious, they laid no hand on the plunder. That's important. Keep in mind the decree. The decree allowed the victor to loot the defeated. Okay, So the enemies of the Jews could defeat the Jews and take their stuff. And the Jews could defend them stuff and take their stuff. But the Jews refused. Why did they refuse? Okay, We're told three separate times, verse 10, verse 15, and verse 16, that the Jews refused to take the plunder. Why? All right. We have to remember that Haman was an Agite. This goes back hundreds of years. Haman was a descendant of Agag, the king of the Amalekites. All right. The Amalekite king, Agag, waged war against Israel. And in that war, the war against King Agag and the Israelites, God gave very specific instructions. God said, do not plunder. That was one of the rules of holy war. God said, when I send you into war, do not take the plunder. Okay, Kill everyone, and whatever you find, you can't take it. You've got to give it to God. Okay, The Jews understood who Haman was. He was related to Agag, and they abided by the age-old laws or rules of holy war. Uh, author Karen Jobs writes this. The author, talking about the author of Esther, the author is careful to say three times that the Jews did not lay their hands on the plunder, even though Mordecai's decree allowed it. Mordecai's decree included the permission to plunder because he was reversing the exact terms that Haman's decree had previously established. However, unlike the Agags, Agag, <laughs> however, unlike the Agites' intent, talking about Haman, the Jews understood the execution of Mordecai's decree as governed by the ancient command of holy war against the Amalekites. One of the rules of ancient holy war was that plunder must not be taken. Okay, well, here's what that means. When Mordecai wrote the decree, he wrote the decree using the exact same words that Haman used. So Haman said you can plunder, so Mordecai said that you can plunder, but the Jews understood that's not right. We're not going to do that. And so they didn't. They refused to plunder. All right, pretty straightforward. However, this is where things get complicated. All right, we keep reading. We come to verses 11 through 19. The original decree was for one day and one day only. It was the 13th day of Adar. This was the only day it could take place. However, at the end of the day, the king asks Esther, what else can I do for you? Is there anything else you want? And Esther responds, and the response has troubled Jews and Christians alike for many years. It's been a troubling response. What was her response? Go back and look. What did Esther ask for? Esther makes two requests. She says, first, I want the dead bodies of the ten sons of Haman. Remember, they're already dead. Now she wants them hanged on display. That's what she's asking. Okay? When she says she wants the ten sons of Haman hanged, don't get confused and think, oh, I thought they were already dead. They were already dead. She wants them hanged on display. She's basically asking that their bodies be impaled in the city for all to see. The second thing she asks is for another day to continue killing the enemies of the Jews. Pretty harsh request. Now, let's talk about these. First request. While we may view this as harsh, this was standard practice in ancient times. Okay? And it actually had a really practical purpose. Why would you impale the dead bodies of these individuals for all to see? Esther was not being cruel. She wasn't being um, morbid or anything like that. This was hundreds of years ago, folks, thousands of years ago. They didn't have the nightly news. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have Twitter. How were you supposed to spread the word about who was victorious and who was defeated? How would they know who the winners were and who the losers were? Well, it's quite simple. The losers were impaled on stakes and set in the city for all to see. Everyone could walk by and see, oh, <laughs> You lost because, you know, you're on a big stick. So 
yes, this is kind of morbid to us, but this actually had a really practical purpose. It was a way to announce and publicize the execution of individuals. They clearly knew who won, who lost. It's the second request that's caused some problems. It's the second request that has been puzzling. Throughout the years, many have found this excessive and morally questionable. While the, f the first day of battle, the 13th of Adar, was all about self-defense, this second day appears to be an offensive attack. Again, the, 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 she asks for permission for the Jews to attack, but the enemies of the Jews are not allowed to. They're not allowed to attack, and they're not even allowed to assemble. That seems unfair. It seems unjust. It seems not right. What are your thoughts? Is this morally acceptable? Or has Esther now become the villain of the story? As we said earlier, this is where history and fiction differ. If this were a fictional account, we would want all the details. We would want to know what was Esther thinking, what was Esther feeling, what was Esther's motivation, why did she do this. But we're not given any of that. We're not given any insight into Esther's thoughts, her emotions, or her motivations. So we have to accept that to some extent this is going to remain mysterious to us. We're not going to fully understand. That being said, there are two possibilities that have been proposed by biblical scholars for many years, and both are very viable, possible options. So what are they? Option number one, Esther seeks vengeance. She's the villain. She's the bad guy. Okay? It is possible. It is very possible that Esther ends up committing the same sin as Haman. It is very possible that Esther is so hurt and angered that she now uses the king for vengeance. Just like Haman tried to do. Haman tried to use the king to kill people he didn't like. It's possible that Esther is doing the same thing. Okay, As author Karen Jobs reminds us, the Bible is remarkable in revealing the darker side of God's chosen leaders, often just at their shining moment. Here's what she's saying. The Bible is the absolute word of God. It is true. And because it's true, the Bible often calls out the sins of its heroes. The Bible is the only book that does this. The only religious book that does this. Okay? Think about it. In the Bible, we read about Abraham lying. We read about Jacob cheating. David committing adultery. Solomon allowing idolatry. Peter denying Jesus. Over and over and over again, the Bible tells us, hey, these people weren't perfect, okay? We often elevate these biblical heroes to, to this level of, of close to perfection, which just is not true. They weren't perfect. They made mistakes. It's possible that Esther goes bad. It's possible that the, the book of Esther ends with a warning, don't become the very people you hate. It's possible Esther became just like Haman. That's possible. We don't know. There's a second option. The second option is Esther is merely being thorough. Okay? It is possible that through the events of the 13th of Adar, the first day of battle, that Esther and Mordecai become aware of way more enemies than they realized. Okay? They may have feared further future attacks from these powerful enemies. Okay? It doesn't make sense to say, oh, now we're aware of all of these enemies, but we just have to ignore them. What if they come and attack us again? What if they work behind the scenes to hurt us? Okay? Keep in mind, the second day of fighting that Esther requests, the 14th day of Adar, this second day of fighting is extremely limited in scope. The first day, it was allowed throughout the kingdom. Everyone everywhere was allowed to do this. However, on the second day, only the capital city of Susa is allowed. The rest of the kingdom is not allowed to do this, only in the capital city of Susa. 
This fact from the scripture lends credence to the explanation that Esther was not becoming like Haman. She was simply eliminating future threats. Okay? It's possible that she was just taking care of business. In other words, it is possible that so many people, especially in the capital city of Susa, where Haman had family, where Haman had friends, where Haman had high-ranking, powerful people, it's possible that so many enemies came against the Jews that the Jews were just unable to address them all in one day. Okay? While they're fighting all of these enemies, the day comes to an end and they're still there. There's still enemies there. It doesn't make any sense to say, okay, you can go home now. Think about that. You're in the process of defending yourself against people who want you dead. And the day ends and you say, okay, shake hands, have a great day, see you tomorrow at work. That doesn't make any sense. You can't live like that. Okay? So it's possible, very likely... There were so many enemies identified in the capital city that Esther has to say, look, we can't go on as business as usual. We have to address this. And so another day is asked for and another day is given. Again, commentator Karen Jobs writes, on the other hand, Esther's reasons for a second day of killing in Susa may have been legitimate, even though they are unknown to us and were also possibly unknown to the author. Haman was, after all, second only to the king, and he likely had many in Susa who were loyal to him and his decree. Esther's request is another instance of the disquieting moral ambiguity that characterizes this story. Rather than attempting to resolve it, we should reflect on it. In other words, it's very possible that she's evil. It's very possible that she was just... Uh, finishing what had to be finished. I think there's more evidence for the latter. But, we may never know. Okay? Whatever her reason, her request is granted. The second day of fighting goes on. And this these verses end by explaining that is the reason why the Jews celebrate what's going to become, what's going to come, what's going to become known as the Feast of Purim. Those outside the city fought on the 13th, and so they celebrated on the 14th. Those inside the city fought on the 13th and the 14th, and they celebrated on the 15th. So what did they do? Well, they said, let's just celebrate on both days. Okay, we got some group celebrating one day, some group celebrating another day. And when we keep reading, we come to verses 20 through 32. Mordecai describes all of this, and he says, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're not going to have two separate holidays. We're going to make them one big holiday, and you're going to celebrate the Feast of Purim on both days, on the 14th and the 15th. And so they began this celebration. They celebrated by feasting. They celebrated by giving gifts to one another. They celebrated by helping the poor. All right. Verses 23 through 28 briefly recap the events of Esther. They describe the Jews' commitment to celebrate the Feast of Purim. Why is it called that? If you go back early in the book, um, Haman cast lots. The word for lots is pure. He cast pure. And so they call this the Feast of Purim because what Haman used to, to try and destroy the Jews, God used for good. And the chapter ends with Esther signing off on this new holiday, makes it official. We then come to chapter 10. Chapter 10 is really short. It's just three verses. Um, it starts, chapter 10 starts with King Ahasuerus or Xerxes. Again, Esther begins with the king, it ends with the king. One of the most powerful kings in the ancient world was used by God to save his plan and his people. All right. And again, uh, finally, the book of Esther ends with a reminder that this is not fiction, it's historical fact. Any of the original readers, they could have found verification of these facts in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Media and Persia. True story. Whew. So, Esther comes to an end. What do we do with Esther? How do we apply some of these lessons from chapter 9 and 10? What do we learn? First thing we learn is that God will always be victorious. God will always be victorious. The obvious lesson from this is God is victorious. 
Okay. While God is not mentioned anywhere in the book of Esther, it's clear that God is in control, God is working behind the scenes, and God is victorious. God used Esther, God used Mordecai, God used King Ahasuerus, God even used Haman to bring about his victory. The writer of Proverbs tells us in Proverbs 21, 31, the horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. God may use many different means. He may use many different people. He may even use a horse. But victory belongs to God. Yes, Mordecai and Esther obeyed. Okay? Their, their choices were important. But still, the victory belongs to God. God is victorious. Esther is yet another example that God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He is able to rescue us from any situation, any hardship, any difficulty. And I don't mean this merely in the spiritual sense. I mean this in the physical sense. God can rescue you from anything. Cancer, disease, death threats. God can rescue and deliver you from anything. Just as God gave the victory to Esther and Mordecai, God can give the victory to you. Just as God saved Daniel from the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fire, God can save you from any physical threat. However, and this is key, because God is able does not mean God is obligated. Because God is able doesn't mean God is obligated. Yes, God can choose to save you and he often does. I am sure there are times in your life where you should have died, but God saved you. Okay? But that doesn't mean he's obligated. Can he rescue us from anything and everything? Yes, he absolutely can. But there are times he chooses not to. There are times that God chooses to rescue us, and there are times that God chooses to allow us to go through difficulty so that we grow, so that we mature, so that we become stronger. While we often value the physical victory over the spiritual victory, God values the spiritual victory. And so sometimes God will allow us to be physically defeated in this life so that he can get the spiritual victory. God will always be victorious. And ultimately, God will be victorious, and we will be victorious at the end of time when we spend eternity in heaven. Another lesson, that's the first lesson, another lesson we can learn is that motivation matters. While we don't know Esther's motivation, we do know that motivation matters, right? It, it's a big difference. There's a big difference in, is Esther the villain or is Esther just protecting her people from further threats? That's a big difference. Which is it? I don't know. A good argument can be made that she did the right thing. I think that's more consistent with the story. But it's possible she acted out of fear and pain and made a bad decision. What do we do with this enigma? What do we do with this mystery? New, uh, Old Testament scholar Karen Jobs recommends, rather than attempting to resolve it, we should reflect upon it. We should reflect upon it. Motivation matters. We should reflect upon our own motivations, folks. Before you act, before you make an important decision, you should reflect upon your thoughts, your emotions, your motivations. Why are we saying what we're saying? Why are we doing what we're doing? Psalm chapter 139, verse 23 and 24. Here's what the psalmist says. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, God. Try my heart. Acknowledging that motivation matters, we should reflect upon our own motivations. Why are we doing what we're doing? Are we making sinful decisions? Or are we making righteous decisions? Finally, last lesson. Let's just remind ourselves one last time of the theme of this book. And the theme of this book is the providence of God. God will protect his plan and his people. He always has and he always will. All right. When chapter 1 began, there was no way anyone could have predicted the outcome of the king's decision to banish Queen Vashti. That's how this all started. The king got mad at his queen and kicked her out. Why? Well, that's just such a weird thing, right? No one could have seen that God was going to use that in a mighty way to display his glory, to display his power. 
No one could have anticipated the reasoning behind Esther becoming queen. Why would God do that to her? God works in mysterious ways, folks. Throughout the first half of this book, it seems like nothing more than random coincidence. However, we know it's not coincidence. We know it's the providence of God. We know that God is working even when we don't understand it. Even when we think it's mysterious, God is working. Theological term for this is the providence of God. No, we will not always understand why God does what he does. Listen to me. I don't always understand why God allows the things to happen to me. You won't always understand why God allows the things to happen to you that he does. We don't need to understand. You don't need to understand. You need to trust and obey. Trust God. Obey God. Trust that God knows what he's doing. Strive to obey his word. Let's remind ourselves as we end. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Paul says in Romans 8, 28, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who call are called according to his purpose. Don't worry about understanding everything. Trust God. He's in charge. Obey God. He'll handle the rest. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We thank you for the study of Esther. We thank you for the time you've given us to just to delve into your word. Pray that you remind us, Lord, no matter what we're going through, that you're there, that you're working, that you have plans. Lord, our responsibility is not to understand everything, but to trust you in everything and to obey you in everything. We thank you, Lord. We ask you to watch over us and to protect us as we leave. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. We'll see you for our next study. Uh -huh.